Uh, we're now moving on to two presentations on the ecology of the lower lakes. The first presentation is from Scott Wedderburn uh, and Bill Wilson, who will be talking about threatened fish, yabbies and turtles in the lower lakes. Uh, please welcome to the microphone, Scott and Bill. Okay, uh, hi everyone. Um, yeah, Scott, I'm Scott Wedderburn. I'm gonna talk about um, the threatened fishes in the lower lakes and the Living Murray program. And uh, then I'll hand over to Bill Wilson, of course, and to talk about some of the um, projects that I've also been doing with the um, Northern Jerry Aboriginal Corporation. Um, so before I start talking about the threatened fishes, now, um, yeah, before I start talking about those, I just wanted, because I've been asked to sort of reflect a little bit on the Living Murray time, I'm gonna go back to the mid nineties when um, I was working in a factory, um, only supposed to be there for six months and five years later, I'm still in this factory in my mid twenties and, and wondering what I was gonna be doing in my life. And, and um, then um, one, one weekend on, was looking for something to read in the news agent and rather than buying the street machine magazine i <coughs> i spotted this um australian natural history magazine which i still have now and anyone that knows me will probably wouldn't be surprised that i still have this but um i heard nadine laughing there um yeah so um and then i started reading this magazine and and thought wow people um do this for a living they they study wildlife for a living so i um did a few year 12 subjects got into uni and then by um, the second year uni I did my first fish project um, at Pilby Creek and Lock 6 wetlands, thrown into the deep end using gill nets and so on. Um, and then in um, honours 1999-2000 I, I met Michael Hammer um, and I'm not sure if you know Michael Hammer but his, his interests are fish, 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 pizza, fish. So. Um, so I, it rubbed off on me even more and I learned a lot from Michael and about um, fish surveys um, and identification of fish. There's, there's a lot of fish to learn. And um, by 2002, the summer of 2002, 2003, under Native Fish Australia SA, we did the first ever um, fish survey in the lower lakes. Um, and during there, we, we identified a lot of a lot of different fish species, but also the three threatened fish species that um, I'm going to talk to you about in a moment. Um, so that was obviously at the start or middle of the millennium drought. And, and during that time, the, these fish populations were doing really well. Um, so that, um, that um, discovery triggered some monitoring during, through what was called the drought action plan that Sadi undertook. And I, was, I went along on a lot of that field work as well. Um, and then it morphed into the Living Murray condition monitoring in around 2007. And um, I was lucky enough to be able to start that work in 2008 and been doing it ever since through the University of Adelaide. Um, obviously that was during the, the, um, <clears throat> like the, the height of the drought. So all, these, all three of these fish species um, became extirpated from the lower lakes. There were some, fit, some pygmy perch or, and Murray hardyhead. So they're the three three fish species, the Murray hardyhead, Yarra pygmy perch and southern pygmy perch. Um, they were rescued for reintroduction, later reintroductions. Um, and um, I'm going to just show you some of the information. So there was no records of the fish for the first few years of, of me undertaking the um, condition monitoring. And uh, so there's not really much to show you here on the chart, but um, there were introductions of the, these three fish species in 2011 and 2012, and you can ask a little bit more about that later if you want to talk to in the panel discussion. Um, so the, they sort of first started to show up in 2016. So this is March every year, March 2016, March 2017, and so on. And you can see that there's apparent recovery of these fish species. And just the thing that I wanted to, to you to see from this chart is that the corresponding water levels in March, which are the troughs in the water level chart above, if you get a couple of consecutive years there, you'll get increases in numbers of the southern pygmy perch. And if you have a few years that where it blow, drops below the 0.6, maybe down to 0.5, you'll notice the numbers decrease. So that's also supported by statistical model modeling that Tom Barnes did, um, where there was a, a significant relationship between water levels and um, pygmy perch abundances in March. So the good thing about being a field ecologist is that 
even though the numbers and figures show you this sort of thing, you can sort of get a feel for it in the field as well. And so just as an example, even though um, 20 centimetres doesn't sound like much of a, of a difference in Lake Alexandrina, in the fringing wetlands it's amplified. And you can see here in, in November 2019 when we, we captured lots and lots of southern pygmy perch at this site, the water level is about 60 centimetres deep. And with, a, with a Lake Alexandrina water level only about 20 centimetres lower, we're sort of looking at only about 20 centimetres deep. So, it, And you can imagine that the um, pressures that it puts, fish, puts on the fish uh, for example, some of the threats to the pygmy perches and Murray Hardy head are, are introduced fish, such as redfin perch. And you can see there, um, we, we did an intervention monitoring project uh, through the Living Murray, where we found that redfin perch will switch from eating invertebrates to native fish at about eight centimetres long, and they're really effective predators. So you can imagine when those water levels are dropped in March, they're going to be um, having a feast. And same with the um, eastern gambusia, or some people might know it as mosquito fish. Um, they, their numbers are really high in March, so the, they're, they're very aggressive and they'll sort of um, outcompete and um, antagonise the, the native fish. There's also, if you reduce those water levels in those fringing wetland sites, you also reduce the volume of habitat for fish, so you're impacting on their food resources. And I've just shown you these photos because they're nice pretty pictures, but um, I've, I've done a couple of intervention monitoring projects through the Living Murray with um, Russell Shill, who is an international zooplankton expert, so that's been great to learn a lot about the um, food of the fish as well. Another thing, another tool that's been really good for the, um, useful for the, um, for the Living Murray projects is the use of otoliths. So um, most of you probably know that the otoliths are the uh, calcified um, parts in the, in the ears of fish and, and you can use those, each fish species has its own individual shape, so this, what, that's what this slide is showing you here and that's really handy in a diet study where you're looking at the gut of a fish and it's basically just mush and um, so you can find these otoliths and, and you can identify what the fish has eaten. But even better is um, you can take a cross section of that otolith and you can count, if, if the fish is young enough, you can count the daily growth bands or the daily growth increments and so you, could, you know the date you've collected the fish, you can count back to the day that it was hatched so then you know when the fish were breeding. So on this chart here, um, I've just shown in the orange arrow where this, this individual was hatched out on the 25th of September, um, just as the water levels are rising in the lakes and then I've just marked in red here, these, these bands are wider um, for a period of two or three weeks and and that's indicating faster growth during that period. And you can see in there as well that that's during a period of a spring flow pulse, which is from the use of water for the environment. So to get these fish, give these fish a head start and get them through to um, adulthood, it's really important to get them, get them growing as quickly as possible. So this is, um, this is a good thing to help them get through these lower water levels that you'll see, you can see there in March and, uh, and avoid all those pressures. So, um, yeah, so just briefly, the key learnings from all of this long-term data is that um, we've been able to use this information to, to help define um, water level requirements to enhance, to enhance southern pygmy perch populations. Murray Hardy Head is a different story, and if you remember about that chart, when we have an increase in pygmy perch numbers, we, have, we tend to have a decrease in the, in the Murray Hardy Head numbers. Um, in our catches anyway. So that's, that's because they're quite different ecologically. So it's a bit of a tricky thing with um, giving advice on these fish species. You may give advice to benefit one, but not the other. Um, the, it's looking like there's, there's benefits to the spring flow pulses, and it would be great to investigate that further. And this is, this is obviously it's not all about the fish, the water level management, but the fish, these fish which are ecological specialists that um, sort of provide an indication of ecosystem health, um, uh, contribute towards the holistic management of the lakes. So the key knowledge gaps, really, we, we need to understand better what's happening with Murray Hardy Head because the numbers seem to be low, but um, it looks like there's more of a habitat shift than anything during the higher or more favourable river conditions. So they are out there. I'm looking out there now. <laughs> they're out there somewhere. Um, and I did actually poke around in some other places and find them, but they're not in our 24 monitoring sites, unfortunately. 
So it's a bit misleading there. Um, and we can use, and I think there's an opportunity to use the long-term data that we've collected with the, with the length data and incorporate some more OLIF knowledge into um, um, more modelling and, and understanding better the fish populations for, to advise management in the, through the scientific advisory group. Um, and then the other obvious thing is to get Yarra Pygmy Perch back into the Murray-Darling Basin because the Lower Lakes is the only place that the species are found. Um, so like I said, there were reintroduction, a couple of reintroduction attempts, but they failed. And in 2018, Nick Whiterod and I published a paper to show that, um, showing that it was the first freshwater fish extirpation in the Murray-Darling Basin. Um, that, was a pro that was a survey funded by the Murray-Darling Basin Authority as well. Um, and there have been some reintroductions recently. And if you ask Sylvia Zukowski about that um, in the question time, she'll, she'll give you a bit more information on that. There's some early good news so final reflections, so that's when I go back to my uh, magazine that I've kept for years, 30, 25 years. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, it's got a good, good cover here, big beaky and beautiful pelicans. I thought that was interesting. Um, yeah, so, um, so the TLM, basically I finished my PhD in 2008 and went straight into doing the Living Murray um, condition monitoring and thanks to Adrian for believing me in, in, in doing, being able to do this. Um, and I wasn't the sort of person that would go on to do you know, high, high level research. Um, I'm just not a competitive sort of person and, and there's limited funds in that sort of area and, and if you're not willing to do work 60 hours a week then you're probably out of the running there. So the TLM has pro provided me with the opportunity to, to do this sort of monitoring um, and you know, realise my dream I guess. Um, and it's also helped me get to know the lower lakes especially, um, so get to know the habitats but, and the animals and I'm not, I'm not talking about the animals anymore, anymore but I'm, um, it's also got to know some really good landholders and um, made some really good friendships there. Sometimes not so good on the, uh, on the uh, liver but um, if you know what I mean but um, it's been really, really fun and um, yeah and, and always there's people that are willing to stand on the side of the wetland and talk about what what's happening in their local area and, and that's been great and <coughs> really informative for me. And then lastly, before I hang up, hand over to Bill, um, in the last 10 years I've been working on country on Nutajari Yalarui with um, uh, members of the Nutajari community and it's been awesome. Um, and over that time, it, it took a few years but I gradually started to change the way I looked at things and now I um, see that there's a lot more value to what I'm doing um, with the um, cultural connection and working with the um, community. So I'm going to hand over to Bill now because I've probably gone over time. And he's going to talk to, to you about some of the projects that we've collaborated on um, or I have with the NAC over the last few years. Thanks.